This is a set of numbering nines rods invented by Joseph Moxon in 1684. There's a lot of them, so you better keep them organized. I just said you better keep them. Each rod is a column of a multiplication table for all the numbers from 0 up to 99. You can use them to multiply a big number by a single digit. Find the link down there and print out some for yourself if you want. You line up the sticks just right and read across to get the answer. The Numbering Nines was the title of a short book published in 1684 in London. Actually, the full title was Enneades Arithmeticae, The Numbering Nines, or Pythagoras. His table extended to all whole numbers under 10,000. And the numbering rods of the Right Honorable John Lord Napier. That's right, these things are inspired by Napier's Bones, which had been published about 70 years earlier. These were the subject of episode 8 of this video series, which somehow became my most popular video ever. It's not my best video, but hey, I don't decide what you all watch. YouTube decides what you all watch. Napier's invention had a mixed response. Some highbrow mathematicians saw it as somehow like an insult to their intelligence. Like, I can just multiply on paper if I really want to. Others, like hotshot scientist Robert Hooke, said that a simple book of multiplication tables was good enough. Hooke said it takes too long to find the right sticks and line them up just right, so you might as well just do the whole thing on paper. But others at the time were really inspired by the bones. They saw it as the beginning of a new era in humanity's relationship to calculation. One person wrote that in using the bones, subtle and abstract speculation is reduced into act. Visionary people of the 1600s predicted that in the future, calculation would not be something accomplished principally in the mind, but it would be done with the hands, on machines. And in this, they were absolutely right. And what would the machines of the future look like? Well, I guess they would look kind of like Napier's bones. And in this, they were absolutely wrong. But there were several folks who tried to make their mark on history by designing better bones. The most famous of these better bones are the Janai rods. That was episode 22 of my video. <laughs> Very smart and fancy, although really just a historical footnote. And if you thought the Janai rods were obscure, well, I got a treat for you. Because these things are a million times more obscure. Joseph Moxon's numbering nines rods. Joseph Moxon was an English publisher, scientist, and maker of mathematical instruments. And by all accounts, Moxon was a Napier Bones superfan. He wrote several books and printed them himself, teaching people how to use the bones, and he made and sold physical sets of Napier's bones in a shop in London. He wasn't really a traditional scientist, you know, he didn't go to Oxford, not the standard academic type. He was a businessman, an entrepreneur. And eventually he did work his way into the high society. In 1678, he became the first tradesman elected fellow of the Royal Society. And he was really into Napier bones. He was mentioned several times by name in the diaries of Robert Hooke, who was a more traditional established scientist. Moxon shewed a book made up of nothing but Napier's bones. Very foolish. So Hook wasn't into it, but Moxon kept at it, and ten years later he published this book. The Latin title is Enneades Arithmeticae, which means something like arithmetical nines. Each of these sticks here have nine numbers written on them, so he called each stick an ennead, which comes from the Greek word for the number nine. The numbering nines! I kind of like the sound of it, though to be honest I can't tell if it's a good name or a terrible one. Unlike Napier, Moxon wrote his book in English. This is late 1600s English, but it's still pretty understandable to modern people. He's really selling it on the cover here. The whole being very useful for most persons, having frequent occasions of accounts, numbering, measuring, surveying, gauging, weighing, demon flirting, etc. All right, let's do some demon flirting. Each rod is just a multiplication table for the number that's written on top. Like the rod for 35 has 35, and then 70, then 105, all the way down to 315. This is what all that Pythagoras business is about in the title. Around this time, the standard multiplication table was referred to as Pythagoras's table. The folklore back then was that Pythagoras was the first person to write down a multiplication table, which is almost certainly false. 
Anyway, to do a multiplication, say something like this one here, you break up the big number in blocks of two digits. So here it'll be 39, 68, 25, and then 04. And then you find those rods and line them all up. Now I'm multiplying by seven, so I look down at the seventh row. Reading this row across, you take the numbers on the sides of each rod and add up the adjacent ones. And the numbers in the middle of each rod just stay like they are. And then that's the answer. Can you believe it? It's like magic. Sometimes you have to do a bit of extra carrying, like in this one here. Here you line them up and the two in the middle, add those and get 11, which needs to carry over into the next digit there. So the final answer is 13179. It's pretty easy to see why it works too. Let's multiply that one by hand, but I'm gonna write it the other way around. Usually you wouldn't do it this way, but you'll still get the right answer. And now instead of multiplying digit by digit, I'm gonna do them two at a time. So first I'll do 93 times three, which is 279. Then I do 43 times three, which is 129, and I offset it appropriately, and then add them up. See those numbers on the rods that get added up? They're the same numbers that you would have added up if you did it by hand. It all checks out. This thing is an improvement on Napier's bones. So why didn't it become more well-known? Well, it's really not that much of an improvement. The benefit is that you're taking the digits two at a time. With Napier's bones, you take one rod per digit, and then you have to add and maybe carry in each position. With the numbering nines, you take one rod for every two digits. So that's half as much adding that you need to do and half as many opportunity for carries. So that sounds pretty good. But actually the carries can get messy here, like here's one. Doing this with Napier bones requires several carries, but it's fine. But with the numbering nines, adding up the adjacent numbers creates the chains of double and triple carries, which is a real pain to deal with. That kind of stuff never happens on the Napier bones. So there are some cases where the numbering nines get a bit messy. And there's a practical messiness too. Remember the biggest criticism of Napier's bones back in the day was that it's a pain to find the right rods when you're trying to line them all up. Well, this problem is 10 times worse with the numbering nine rods. Actually, it's literally exactly 10 times worse. There are only 10 different rods in the Napier's bones set, but there's a hundred different ones here. So when you're presented with a big number to multiply, you gotta fish through your set of rods to find the right ones. The digits go two at a time, so it's true, you only gotta find half as many rods, but you have to dig them out of a pile that's 10 times bigger. That's what they call a bad deal. I guess if you really wanted a decent usable set, you'd make some kind of rack to store them in order. But I don't know, I just keep them in my novelty Darth Vader mug, so it takes me a while to find the right ones. So in practice, in my opinion, it's not really much better than the standard bones. And I didn't tell you the worst part. Actually, my numbering nines rods aren't exactly the way the original rods were intended to be. The original rods in Moxon's book looked like this. Moxon saw them as a giant multiplication table cut into vertical strips. And maybe it's because of that he was really uncomfortable with writing zeros on the left side of a number. Like here's the rod for 25. The third row represents 25 times 3, which is 75, and I write 075 there because you need all three digits in order for the carrying and adding to work out. Like if I just wrote 75 without the O, then you might try to add the next digit onto the 7, which is wrong. But on the original rods, Moxon didn't write 075, I think because he's trying to write a multiplication table, and there's no such number as 075, it's just 75, so instead he writes star seven five okay star seven five instead of oh seven five is not a big deal but then in the book he has to explain what the stars mean and he does it in the most confusing way possible what forever undersell of any column hath more figures or places in it than are in the capital cell of that column then infallibly the figure which is outmost on the left side of that undersell is to be added to the next figure of another column if another column be tabulated by it on the left hand what? This is all just so much easier if you put a zero there. The business with the stars is even worse than it seems. He never writes a zero on the left side, even in the rod headings. That means that if you want to multiply like this, with my set, you get rod 92 and also rod 08. No problem. But the original set doesn't have a rod 08. It would handle that as just a bare 8 together with some more special rules about how you handle a stray zero inside the number you're multiplying. 
And then what about this one? The original set doesn't have a rod zero zero. So again, you have to memorize some special nonsense about what to do with all those extra zeros. All these problems totally disappear if you just treat zero like an ordinary number. Like I know it feels a little weird to put 04 on top there, and it feels stupid to have a whole rod of all zeros, but you need those. Look, I know they don't tell you this in school, but we're all friends here, right? Sometimes in math, you gotta bend the rules a little. Sometimes you gotta get stupid. Like the number zero, it kind of doesn't mean anything, but you gotta act like it's important, and then suddenly it is important. Actually, everything in math is kind of like that. Perfect geometric shapes, sums that go on forever, square roots and negative numbers. These are all things that at a certain level don't really exist. We just made them up. But we made them up for a reason, because they're useful and beautiful. This is what real mathematics is about to me, making up useful and beautiful ideas. I've made up some ideas of my own, and really anybody could, so long as it's consistent with the fundamentals. But it's got to be useful and beautiful, or else nobody cares. And should anybody care about these things, the numbering nines rods? I don't know, I think they're interesting as a historical curiosity. The history of mathematics is full of these cute little one-off ideas. It didn't really go anywhere, not really useful then or now, but it has a certain charm. Hey, I made a nice modern printable version. Click the links up there and print out your own. Then do like I did, talk it up on the social media. See how many real friends you got. Four.